Hey, Ryan, Mark, my friend. Good to Great see you. To see you. Good to so see you. So good to see you. Man. Yeah. So how have you been? Um, uh, I've been I've been a busy daddy. I've been a busy daddy, uh, taking care of the girls, and then uh, we were traveling a bit. I was in Paris a couple of weeks ago for for a talk, and then I was on a boat. I was on a boat between Miami and and the Bahamas doing a talk at at Summit Series, um, and lining up a fun uh, a fun filled summer. Wow, it sounds like you're starting a cult. <laughs> <laughs> do yeah. you want to join you'd be great uh, I, i'll be the first member i think i was the first member <laughs> i think you were the first member actually. yeah so uh yeah i'm really excited to talk to you today and i'm really grateful that you're joining us because your book the immortality key is one of my favorite books and i think it's it's changed consciousness and religion and the way we look at god and psychedelics so i'd love to are, are you sick of talking about it? Yeah, I'm sick of talking about it. Let's talk about let's <laughs> yeah. talk about something else. Yeah. <laughs> we're done with we're done talking about consciousness. Oh yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we can dive in. Well, let's dive into it. So, uh, just in case for the people who, who haven't read the book or heard of the book, what did you set out to accomplish with Immortality Key? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure I set out to accomplish anything aside from. <laughs> Aside from chase down a passion, um, no, it's fun. Like the the honest truth is that I didn't, I never really expected anybody to read it. I didn't expect it to to catch on. And for the longest time, I was just trying to figure out something that 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 was meaningful to me, which is which is the honest truth. So like, I was a practicing attorney, as you know, for for many years. And on nights and weekends, I was trying to hunt down the best kept secret in history and trying to figure out if there was any truth. To this idea that the ancient Greeks were using psychedelics and maybe the earliest Christians as well. And there wasn't really good data one way or the other for like many years, many decades. The idea goes back to the 1970s at least and probably before that. And I just got caught up in the idea in 2007 and stayed with it and never meant for it to be a book. These were like personal notes I was taking. And for one reason or another, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't put it down. So like 10 years into research, I started looking for an agent. Miraculously, we got a book deal, and that turned into a whole nother part of the adventure. But the the whole point was just to satisfy my own curiosity that there was that there was something out there. And then after it was published, people started to read it for some reason. Wow, that's that's amazing. So you did the first decade of this research completely on your own. Yeah, and it's funny. Like people have asked me since then, and it never even occurred to me like to look for funding for this or to look for a team or to look for help, like what a normal person would do. Like this was, it was very, very private to me. And, and like part of it is still private to me. Like that, and that was the most exciting part of it was that I would, I would go down these rabbit holes and, you know, go visit an archeological site or, uh, you know, spend time in a library or museum. And while trying to also raise daughters, like that, that was that was just to satisfy my curiosity because there was a part of me that wasn't fulfilled, being being a lawyer or just a lawyer. Like I can never be just just one thing. So that that private hunt was a good ten years just by myself with no assistance whatsoever, nobody looking over my shoulder. And then even after the the book contract, I mean, my editor was there during the writing phase, obviously, and and my my agent was a, a good champion behind the scenes, but there were still like, there was still no help. There were, there were no interns, there were no research associates. There was no extra funding uh, beyond the advance for the book. So uh, in, in that sense, it was a very, like it was, I, I think it was very pure. It was like my, my, my pure attempt to try and crack a code. Well, yeah, you can, you can tell there's not really an agenda. It's just a, it's like an Indiana Jones type. You're just going all over the world chasing this curiosity. And I think that's so, authentic and genuine and it's it's kind of like the ultimate selfish journey is the ultimate selfless journey because like you're really trying to explore yourself but if it resonates with you it's going to resonate with other people uh yeah i, I would say the same about about your work i'm not i'm, I'm not going to ask you a question but I, I would i would wager that a lot of what you do and why you do what you do is because like you find it personally interesting and you get to talk to people you find interesting. You get to animate things that you've read and found interesting or listened to. And maybe I will ask you a question. Why do you, why do you, why do you do what you do? 
Well, what you were just saying really resonated deeply with me because it, I, I feel like I did, very much did the same thing. It started off as a hobby. I never yeah. thought that this was going to be a career or anything. I was just like, I like art. I'm curious. Let's try to learn some things. And then kind of making these videos is the best way for me to learn the topic. And the more I like a video, it seems like the more other people like the video. Mm. You know, if I put something out that I'm really like not that thrilled with, it seems like people are like, oh, it looks like you kind of half-assed this. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> how so, many how many years into this are you now uh i've been doing whiteboard animation for about 12 years but after school for seven wow and so oh that that's interesting i don't want to ask you too many questions well, oh, what was that no. what was happening between the, the, those 12 years and the, and the seven years you were just whiteboarding for fun so the first like five or six years i was doing whiteboard animation for companies as a freelancer yeah. and then i kind of just got burnt out doing corporate videos, they were all kind of the same. And you're really not doing an artistic creation. You're just trying to make one person happy. And they're kind of like the gatekeeper and they're like, okay, this video is good to go. And you're like, okay, you know, it, it, to me it's terrible, but as long as you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you kind of get demoralized and then you just get this angst that builds up that, that you want to create something that's your own, that is of a higher potential. Right. So did you have that angst? The, yeah, <laughs> the angst, yeah, the angst was there. I mean, like I said, like as being a lawyer is, it's like, it's very satisfying in, in one sense. I felt like I was a tax paying, contributing member of society, hoping to do good work. And, but it, it just didn't fulfill like a whole other part of myself that got, it was very angsty. I mean, like, like, like I said, it started in, in 2007, went for a good 10 years and like I, I still feel it now, like the, the immortality key is maybe a tiny piece of what I was hoping to do or to accomplish in the world, whatever that means. Uh, and I, st I still feel a deep, deep angst for not having communicated or found what I was hoping to find. Wow, you still feel this, angst. but do you feel like you're kind of on track in, in the right direction now? Yeah, so the, yeah, so there, there's a track there and it leads far over the horizon and i can't really see where where it winds up or why but it, it feels like there's some momentum and i don't know why it took 40 years to get there but i feel i finally feel some momentum for sure well there's no telling how many other people you're inspiring to go on a similar track and explore these ancient mysteries uh, I hope I hope that's the case, man. And, and I love how you say that, by the way. I, I hope I'm not inspiring people to to dabble in psychedelics. Although I mean, that that's that's definitely that's definitely a piece, that's definitely a piece of it. Um, and before you ask, I, I still have not tried them myself. Um, but for 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 me, this you know psychedelics were were part of a much bigger mystery uh, about about our history and an, an untold history uh, that I think is. Is not well looked at, even among the professionals and the classicists. You know, I, I was I was trained by specialists in Latin and Greek and Sanskrit, uh, and I just think there there were questions that went unasked for for too long, and even when they did, they weren't properly answered. Uh, and so I think that we're at, we're at a moment now where we have all this great science and technology. I read a lot about archaeochemistry, like going out into the field and testing these ancient chalices and vessels for the remnants and the residue of these organic compounds and maybe they point to some psychedelic potion or maybe they don't in some instances and we have ai capability and all, all these all these great tools that we can leverage on the past and actually learn new things i think people forget that the whole obsession with history is that sometimes we do actually learn new things and it's a gigantic mystery why uh, why the Jesus movement transformed the ancient world. An, an ancient world, for example, that had plenty of good religions and plenty of good philosophy around. So I'm not saying that psychedelics are the answer, but what I do write about is that this whole concept of, of death before death and dying before dying and this visionary experience and this ecstatic experience, I do think that was, uh, that was a significant part of early Christianity and certainly like the mystery cults of the ancient world before that. And even if you study classics and linguistics and history, there's a good chance you might not hear any any detail about what these mysteries were and why they mattered to our ancestors and how they may have fueled things like democracy and the arts and sciences and religion. So uh, 
yeah, for, for me, I hope I'm inspiring people just to ask more questions about the past. Oh, you absolutely are. And I, I love the way you're approaching this because I think a lot of people that are, are interested in psychedelics come to it through the use of psychedelics and they, they see, wow, there's something amazing here. But it, a lot of the things they describe sound very woo-woo. <laughs> and you're kind of coming from it from this very academic approach, like a lawyer. And you're making this very well-substantiated case that links the two halves. You know, the woo-woo, people love it. And then the academic community is kind of looking at it like, this is okay, there is something here. I think it's so important to connect those two. Thanks, man. I, I, I feel like a, like a strange bridge maker where nobody was asking for a bridge. Not, not, even, not, not even me, but like, again, like following like my own, my own pure passion. Like there's a, there's a huge part of me that's very data oriented. Like I wasn't trained in the sciences, but as a lawyer, you're trained in, in what, in what evidence is, what's probatory and not, and, and all these different standards and burdens of evidence. And I was just, I was so dissatisfied with the literature out there claiming things that just didn't seem true or seemed way off or were high speculation about like what was happening in the ancient past and I, and I knew that there had to be data there so like part of me is just is really really data driven uh, trying to figure out what the, what this all means but then another part of me uh tries to be creative not not as creative as you and um really inspired by music <laughs> <laughs> i can't draw my my daughters are better are better animators than i am um, but like what, what you do fascinates me, like how you take an idea and render it intelligible to people. So like, I, I knew, I knew, I knew my book wasn't going to be like anything I'd read, which I find fascinating, but I know it is, it can be a hard slog for people. So I wanted to write something that was entertaining and had some movement to it. Uh, but that is filled with those 700 end notes at the end of it, in case you had more questions. So uh, I think the the second book hopefully will be will be a similar a similar thriller adventure. Well, I I love the book because it it is like an adventure story. It's very much got these stories and and characters in it, and it it's not just a bunch of dry facts, which it could have been. And I I feel like people don't really respond to facts; they respond to narratives. Right. And so you created this nice, cool adventure, and it had this great conclusion. And I think that adventure really inspires people. Thanks, so, man. <clears throat> the book is called The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. And I was wondering if you could define that religion with no name. What is it? <laughs> uh, what is that religion? So it's, it's, there's, there's something very, very specific in there and there's something very, very broad. I, so I think in, in, in the broadest sense, we're talking about a religion with no name. And I guess, I guess we need to define what a, what a religion is. And so like going back to the Latin, like, like a linguist, so religio is that thing that, that binds you, that binds back together, either, either people or binds us back to this notion of divinity. So it's something has this, this binding agent about it. And, you know, I think today we conceive of religion as something like, like doctrine and dogma or blind belief. And some people are, are brought up in churches or, or temples or mosques where that's kind of the currency of the day. And, and these, you know, largely people are, are familiar with, with um, religions of the book, right? So we typically, if you hear the word religion, maybe you think of the Bible, maybe you think of Judeo-Christianity. Uh, and I think that religion in the ancient world, binding us back to a different notion, was very, very different from all this, this blind belief and this, this, this doctrine and dogma that you can find you know, in this, in this source material, this written material, you know, like the Abrahamic traditions are very much traditions that are, are, are caught in, in history, in, in the written language. But before that, and not even that long ago, like not, not 10,000 years ago, where there is no writing, and we're squarely in prehistory, uh, which by the way, was where our species was for tens of thousands of years, like 99% of our history was as hunter-gatherers, we forget. Uh, but even into like the classical period that I was investigating among the Greeks and Romans, there was sort of this secret oral tradition that they didn't call a religion, they called it the mystery. Uh, but I think that there's something quite spiritual and religious about it because it's where they went for answers to life's greatest mysteries. Like what happens to us after death? And is there some reality to this notion of gods and goddesses? And what does it mean to be immortal? And so 
the the religion that I'm investigating is that kind of religion. It's not a religion of the book. It's not a religion of blind faith. It's a religion of some of the best and brightest from antiquity uh, taking part in these festivals, ceremonies, rituals that they believed put them in touch with the divine. And to be to be blunt about it, they, they believed made them immortal. That anybody who participated in a visceral way in these ceremonies would would never die. Uh, and so that's a very different religion than than we have today. It's a different religion than I was. I was raised Catholic. I went to 13 years of Catholic school, and uh, you know, I was I was raised on on the New Testament, and eventually learned Greek so I could read it properly. And that that's a very different way of participating in religion than I think uh, the ancients were, or that you might find today, by the way, like in in contemplative movements, um, in any in any faith. Uh, for that matter, uh, or even in traditional societies. And so basically, the hunt I was on was for this experience. What is this experience people were 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 trying to hunt down? Um, what did it mean to them? And why does it have no name? <laughs> well, the the mystery is one way to, to talk about it, but at the time, you know, it didn't have a name for for the Greeks and Romans aside from that. But I think part of the thesis I follow in the book is that this could very well be prehistoric. This, this notion of um, a near-death type experience, whether catapulted by psychedelics or some other technology like fasting or, um, or you know, ritual scarification or sleep deprivation, all these archaic techniques, they could very well go back like tens of thousands of years. They could be hundreds of thousands of years old. They could be millions of years old. This could go back to Homo erectus for all we know. And it certainly never had a name for them. And I'm not claiming any grand continuity from like the upper Paleolithic into the ancient Greeks and the Christianity into us, but there's there's some sense that there was this uh, this technique or series of techniques that people knew about that put them in touch with this sense of immortality, and it was very present through all these ancient traditions and and societies, and uh, and it went missing, and we forgot about it. So it doesn't have a name, uh, and maybe it doesn't deserve a name. Uh, we should just call it the mystery. I guess the the experience may have been so profound that it was beyond words. You know, some of the most profound things are it, they they get misinterpreted quite a bit because they're beyond what we can put into words, and they're just you know after a, a, an incredible experience like the Eleusinian mysteries or something, how could you even put something like that into words and give it a name? That right. was um, that that was their that was their thinking too. Maybe <laughs> you answer the question better than I do. Maybe maybe that's the reason it had no name because because you couldn't name it, and that was actually that was also kind of the point. So you mentioned Eleusis. It was the the spiritual capital of the ancient Mediterranean that survives for two thousand years. So about as long as we've had Christianity from like fifteen hundred BC to the fourth century AD, there was this annual celebration around the fall equinox where people from all around the Greek speaking world would march from Athens to Eleusis, a pretty, a pretty healthy march and uh, consume this, this beverage, this, this secret beverage called the Kukion and have this, this vision, this vision of the goddesses in which they were absolutely convinced that they had found the secret to life and the key to, to immortality uh, in a single night, which is, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so what was in that beverage? was the big question that obtained for well centuries really uh, because it was it was all it was all secret and it was uh, it was forbidden to reveal what you saw in Demeter's temple there at Eleusis so the idea was that yeah maybe maybe it was ineffable maybe it was impossible to put into words or maybe they wanted to maintain the secrecy to build up this sense of anticipation around this life transforming thing that you would only participate in once. So if you knew what's going to happen, it kind of spoils the whole game. If you show up there with no sense of um, no climax or, or, or surprise. So there's, there's a lot happening as to why it had no name, why it was secret and like how they maintain the secrecy, which is also crazy. Uh, you know, in, in a culture that was very literate and made records of all kinds of things, for some reason, uh, we have very few indications of what was happening in that sacred temple, one of the holiest places in the ancient world. Wow. So people like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, they all went through this 
rite of passage, these Eleusinian mysteries. Yeah, as 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 far as we're aware. So like like yeah, like the like the godfather of philosophy himself, Plato, makes allusions to experiencing uh, this blessed sight and vision. He talks about the vision explicitly at Eleusis. Uh, Aristotle says that you go to Eleusis not to not to learn something, uh, but to experience something. Uh, so he says, so we're definitely talking about an experience, a visionary experience that transcends the Greek world. And then even after their civilization falls into a bit of demise, the Romans pick it up. And Marcus Aurelius in the second century AD, this is in the time of Christ, in the time of early Christianity, uh, Marcus Aurelius not only is initiated, he's the only lay person allowed inside the Holy of Holies, and he rebuilds the site after the barbarian Kostovox uh, almost destroy it in the second century. So it was just as sacred and holy to the Romans and to the emperor himself as it was to some of the most famous Greek minds that we know. And this matters, again, because this is the age in which today's biggest religion the world's biggest religion christianity is being born right and trying to scrap out an existence in a world in which these mystery cults uh were very very powerful um and very potent so do we have any hard evidence of what was in that drink at eleusis now no well i mean i think <laughs> i think so we we didn't for the longest time and we've been we've been dancing around it so uh, it's again, so it's it's forbidden to talk about uh, the potion or or what happened there. But we do have this hymn to Demeter uh, that goes back even before the classical Greek period. So this is this is going back 2,700, 2,800 years. There's this th this hymn that describes it's sort of like an origin story for how Eleusis becomes Eleusis and Demeter is on the hunt for her her kidnapped daughter Persephone, who's brought to the underworld by Hades, and then she's resurrected. Um, and there's there's a couple lines about, about this, this potion, the kukion, and it mentions some ingredients. It mentions uh, water, barley, and mint, and that's it. And then there's a long gap in the, the text that came down to us, by the way. So it's kind of curious, like why, in the most interesting part, all of a sudden, a bunch of lines are missing. Uh, so, but, but we have that, and that's, that's like all, all we had. Uh, and in 19, in the 1970s, I mentioned one of these theories uh, by uh, Carl Ruck and Albert Hoffman, who discovers LSD, and Gordon Wasson. They write this book claiming that it was something like ergot. They thought ergot was the magical ingredient of this long lost potion because ergot is how Albert Hoffman himself synthesized LSD. So that's where LSD comes from. Ergot is a, it's like a naturally occurring fungus. Uh, it's very pretty, actually. It's this slender blackened rod that shows up on different cereal grains, and it sprouts these these, these purple mushrooms. Uh, and it's been around as long as we've been growing the cereal crops or drinking beer, which could be twelve thousand years old. It could be fifteen or twenty thousand. Uh, we're not really sure, but it, it's certainly old. And it's a really elegant hypothesis because it's this natural fungus that that shows up everywhere. Um, even brewers today have to be on, on the lookout for ergot. If ergot gets into your, your brew, that can be a very toxic thing. So it's, it's still something we struggle with uh, today. Uh, so the, the theory made sense, uh, but again, it was very difficult to find like organic data to support this. There was no archaeochemistry to speak of. Uh, there was no instrumentation to analyze some of these ancient chalices and cups and vessels. And so that, that's where it was left for a very long time until... Long story short, I'm looking for, for ways to substantiate this crazy hypothesis, and I come across this, uh, this archaeological site in Spain, of all places, that was excavated in the 90s, and they discovered this tiny chalice that tested positive for the remains of beer and uh, the, the remains of ergot. Uh, so like the, the very fungus that they had hypothesized back in the late 70s, it shows up in this chalice, it's excavated, tested and basically proven to contain some sort of ergotized beer, and nobody hears about it because the archaeological team publishes it uh, well, in, in Catalan, which not many spe people speak Catalan, and also there, there's some passing references in Spanish, uh, but it's just, it's not picked up by like the wider academic community, and so I reached out to the original team who, who, did, who made the find and did the analysis, like remarkably, they were still around to answer my emails, and we talked and I went to visit the museum 
uh, where uh, this chalice was found. I uh, invited Carl Ruck along with me to go see it. And uh, so now, yeah, I think we do have some pretty, pretty compelling evidence and data that something like a psychedelic potion was in existence in the classical period, because what they found dates to around the second century BC. So this is before Christ, you know, after the classical period, what they call the Hellenistic period in, in the ancient world. But uh, it certainly opens up like a whole field of investigation. Uh, you know, was this just happening there in that little pocket of the ancient Mediterranean, which was very Greek, very Greek speaking? Or was it, was it also in Italy? Was it in North Africa? Was it in Greece itself? Was, was it in the Holy Land? So it opens up a whole field, uh, I think, of inquiry where like very serious scholars can take a look at this data uh, in the hopes of finding more. Is this true or not? Well, that really changes your mind or your your perception of what alcohol and beer could be, because you're saying that the current day beer makers are have to be aware to keep this ergot out of the beer, but maybe in the past they they encouraged it. You know, that's what they really wanted. Right. No, I mean, even, there are German laws that talk about this. I mean, up until a few hundred years ago, like beer was routinely mixed with different plants and herbs and maybe maybe fungi. That That's one of the, the main points I make in the book is that both wine and beer were routinely mixed with all these different additives and these different ingredients. It wasn't about it wasn't about the alcohol. Uh, and I, I always make this point that uh, the Greeks had no word for alcohol. It's that comes from the, the, the Semitic alcohol. So the, the Greeks had no word for alcohol, like the magic and the intoxication that they experienced through beer or wine wasn't because of that of that ethanol. It was something like the grain or the or the or the grapes being mixed with all these additives and, and ingredients. And we have recipes. We have so many recipes that were recorded in antiquity uh, from the fourth, third century BC all the way through again, the time of Christ, at the same time that the Gospels are being written, we have all these different wine recipes talking about mixing wine with like very, very psychedelic compounds like like mandrake and henbane and all these crazy solanaceous witchcraft plants. So uh, we know that the, this stuff was out there and it survived for, for centuries. And it wasn't until relatively recently that we stopped mixing these things into the beer under, under the, these German purity laws, by the way, uh, in, in the early modern period. So it's like- Germans. The, the the Germans took all the fun out of it <laughs> for some reason. People were having a great time uh, on these on these toxic beers and wines, and then now now we're we're left with this. And, and again, we forget we for, just like the mysteries themselves. This religion with no name, like we we kind of forget like how old beer really is, which is at least twelve thousand years. How old wine really is, which I mean, some of the better data is more like uh, you know six to eight thousand years. Uh, but this th th this is really really old technology that was that was perfected uh, largely by by women who were the brewers of this period uh, who mixed the wine of this period and it's a it's a story that that was forgotten for for far too long. Hmm, that's interesting that you mentioned that it was largely brewed by women. Is this at all connected to witchcraft? Because I I've heard that have you heard that rumor that. The Salem witch trials were connected to ergot in the fields and yeah. Yeah, there's, I haven't there's really a, looked into that, but is there any validity to that? That rumor? Uh, there, there's there, there's a decent paper about it. Um, there's there's no uh, there's no archaeochemical data that that I know of or archaeobotanical, but there's there's a really decent paper that was written about it. Uh, I think I think there's I think there's better evidence for the use of psychedelics in in witchcraft that I I write about in in the book, um, and there there's there's some really compelling books written about this. A friend of mine, Tom Hatzis, writes a great book about this called The Witch's Ointment, which really digs into the notion of, of psychedelics and witchcraft, like in the in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. It's fascinating stuff. And so like the theory is that like all, all these mixed potions don't disappear uh, until until that that time, like until the Inquisition, really. So they're around for 1500 years, 1600 years or more after after Christ, and uh, even the Pope's personal physician is writing about this, this this witch's ointment and the fact that it might contain like mandrake and henbane, like I mentioned before. Th those are classic, uh, you know, indigenous to Europe, witchcraft associated uh, psychedelic plants that survive all the way through the record. They have these very crazy 
uh, tropane alkaloids, uh, which is not the most pleasant psychedelic experience, but the kind of thing that if you mix into the right potion or rub on your broomstick will produce the sensation of flight and nocturnal ecstasy and some of the things that pop up in the, in the witchcraft literature. So it's, it's really, really fascinating stuff, man. That is so fascinating. It, it's like our culture, our modern day culture has suppressed a lot of this psychedelic woo woo superstition stuff, but it still calls to us like things like Harry Potter are so important to our culture or yeah. Lord of the Rings or these stories that contain magic and um, mystery and witchcraft. It's like almost if, if our civilization just disappeared today and they dug up evidence of us a thousand years from now, they would see posters of Harry Potter. They'd see all these books and all these statues erected. They'd, they'd go to Universal Studios and be like, these people worshiped witchcraft. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there'd be big billboards of Thor and Marvel characters. And they'd, they'd think of us as like the Greeks. Like, wow, they had all these gods. We're pretty irrational people. Yeah, yeah. Despite, despite the skyscrapers and the smartphones, uh, we worship Smurfs. I was watching this, <laughs> the Smurfs with, with my daughters th this weekend. I mean, all, all you see is the Amanita muscaria mushroom on, on virtually every scene. And, and they're, they're, they're blowing up potions and there's nothing but sorcery and, and witchcraft. Uh, it's the same with a lot of Disney movies. I mean, th this stuff survives in its own like interesting folkloric way. And uh, yeah, and then that's that's where it survived, I think, for for a long time. And I think in the past, I mean, certainly there was the 50s and 60s with the psychedelic explosion, which then went underground. But I think re in recent years, you're beginning to see some of this, like the, the excavation of all this cultural knowledge is beginning to come to the surface again, which is really fascinating. So how has the church responded to this? <laughs> not not terribly maybe that's a bit not not terribly you know like um yeah i was i wasn't sure what to expect from from the church but like uh in the book of course uh father francis accompanies me on some of the some of the adventure and so i was you know i, I was careful to to bring in all the all the expertise to try and make sense of the story and even before the book came out i was talking to orthodox priests about this uh, I've learned a lot more about orthodoxy uh, than, uh, than than I used to know growing up Catholic. Uh, so I've talked to all kinds of different clergy from different denominations, and um, and they reach out to me too as well, which I wasn't expecting. So some people are reading the book, and and I think I, I try and do like a very a very data driven job of you know hosting the conversation that looks at this as a possibility, right? Uh, and I think. In, in that sense, the conversations have been like very productive and fruitful. I don't get that much hate mail from uh, from people of faith. Uh, I consider myself a person a person of faith, and you know I I I, I cherish my like my training with with the Jesuits, which I, I talk and write openly about. Like it was the Jesuits who taught me Greek and Latin, and and uh, you know taught me to ask big questions about God, not to accept anything at face value, and I don't think they anticipate it like me using the, the Latin and Greek to go down psychedelic rabbit holes, but like it was at least part of, of what you could extrapolate from that kind of that kind of training. So um, I've been back and forth to to, to Rome uh, to continue sort of the investigation and conversation. And I got to say, like, I find I find people like wonderfully open minded about about the the hypothesis. And, and, that, and that's that, that's all it is. And I think that you know, it demands it demands data to uh, to suggest its trajectory, like in in one path or another. Like, was were, were these just random potions that that showed up in the archaeological record, or was there something more and more meaningful here? And I think people want to know, like, to what extent visionary experience and ecstatic experience played a role in the early part of the church. So, uh, long answer to your question, it's been it's been surprisingly uh, productive conversation. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, have you received any backlash? Uh, to like, to be honest, like not not too much. No. Wow. <laughs> I'm, so, <laughs> I'm still waiting for it. Uh, not no, not not too much, man. Um, I guess I guess I guess we'll see. The book is being translated. It was just translated into Spanish. So, you know, there, there's a big part of, of the Catholic world 
that that might just be hearing about this for the first time uh, around Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, it's it's been translated to Italian, uh, Romanian, uh, Polish, uh, Korean for some reason. I didn't get any hmm. no mail from Korea yet. Uh, so Have like, what about Japan? No, nothing in Japan yet. You you know what's weird is Graham Hancock told me that Japan is where he sells the most books. Yeah, he told me the same thing. Uh, it was uh, like it was a raging success for him in Japan. So we we need to look down uh, yeah. the, at Japan. And he he wrote the Ford for your book. He did. Yeah. And that's that's great that you you had a. Uh, how did you uh, get in touch with Graham for for the book? Uh, Graham and I I wrote him a random email. Uh, this was back in it must have been twenty. Man, I think my daughter had just been born. It was twenty fourteen, maybe the end of twenty fourteen. And I, I told him, you know, at that point, I was I was already like several years into this 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 weird passion project of mine. And again, not not really expecting to make anything of it. But then I wrote him saying, like, there, there's there's the seeds of this idea here. And um, I guess I was reaching out for for advice, like what to what to make of it, because I was really inspired by his book, Supernatural, uh, which I read in that same time period, 2007, 2008. And it just it really blew my mind about the potential for this hypothesis and in supernatural he charts the potential use of, of hallucinogens uh, and its impact on prehistoric uh, cave and rock art which is which is really really fascinating stuff uh, drawing on the the work of david lewis williams in south africa and it just it's a beautiful book it's it's a crazy book uh and it just like blew my mind to the to the big potential here like i was always focused on this one aspect of history like the classical world and early christianity and I think that that's part of where this notion of this this uh, this longstanding religion came from. Like, could this very well be prehistoric or Paleolithic? Uh, is is it possible that psychedelics could explain the so-called Great Leap Forward? Uh, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, where we become like modern human beings, capable of symbolic thought and spiritual insight. Um, it's a really, really like long, big story. And so I, I reach out to him. Uh, basically just to say thank you for writing for writing that book and looking for advice and we became fast friends and he was he's he's been nice to me every every step of the way he couldn't he couldn't be nicer yeah same to me i've i've always had good interactions with him and he's been a big motivator in in after school and i hope to collaborate again with him in the future i and hope so too yeah graham graham has kind of paved the way for a lot of these um He's opened our mind up to different versions of history that, you know, we have this very rigid idea of it's like a linear story that we've been told, but it could be very sawtooth. Right. And he opens that door and we're like, huh, you know, you realize how little we do know. Right. I, li yeah. I like his line about being a species with amnesia. Uh, so I, I try not to steal that line, but it's a, but it's a it's a good one. And, and, and I think that it's it's the same, not just about prehistory, which was you know his focus for a long time. Although he also read a, a great book about uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which I was I was rereading re just a couple of days ago, the Sign of the Seal. Uh, so uh, I think that the, this this notion of of amnesia, I mean, certainly goes back to our prehistory, where we have no written records, and all we have is is folklore, myth mythology, and these traditions that get passed down as stories. Uh, but I, I do think there's a great amount of, of of amnesia, or maybe it's illiteracy about the classical world too. Like I spent all these all these years studying Latin and Greek, and and even in that setting, like the mysteries weren't widely discussed. This notion of a psychedelic hypothesis was rarely discussed. Um, it wasn't as controversial when I was studying as it was maybe in the 70s, 80s, 90s. There was just not like not a lot of attention was placed on it so i think we have a lot of amnesia about what was happening to those people like what inspired our ancestors like what really motivated them and we have all kinds of amnesia about early christianity which again growing up catholic uh you know when i went into, into the catacombs under the streets of rome and was looking at like the actual evidence for what the earliest eucharistic celebration looks like like you you see things that i was never taught in catholic school you see women for example like mixing up wine in in these in these celebrations of death which is really what it was in these catacombs so i think that there's i think we have a lot of amnesia around what was happening even even in recent memory or the fact that the, the germans ruined beer 
like you mentioned like who, who remembers that the germans ruined beer just a few centuries ago well now they're trying to make up for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you made me think do, do you believe that, that there is some sort of collective memory that we have in our species and maybe certain ideas that really resonate deeply with us are kind of calling back to yeah, something yeah, for sure. that happened in I our mean, past. Yeah, I mean, Jung, Jung writes, he writes the most impressively about this. And so I think there, there's something to the, the archetypes of the collective unconscious, whatever that means. And even, even going back into the, the cave and rock art, it's funny, you see, you see, certain, you see certain motifs uh, that, that reveal themselves time and again among peoples that as far as we know had had no contact with each other I mean, so we're talking like from southern africa to australasia right or even in the americas uh, the same types of, of of imagery uh can pop up and so you know part of that can be explained just maybe by like the the, the physiological structure of the human brain but uh, there might be something much more profound about uh, these archetypes and where they came from how they instantiated themselves why uh why these gods and goddesses spoke to so many ancient humans for so long and and where we get these notions today where our dreams come from uh it's fascinating to i mean that, that's that's what jung did you look at you look at dreams and uh it's funny there's different people around the world have different different nightmares there, there's a great chart out there on the internet somewhere you can look it up where the, the most prevalent nightmare, depending on where you live in the world, in some parts of the world, it's in a lot of parts of the world, it's snakes. In some part of the, parts of the world, it's your teeth falling out. Uh, so like, where, did, where does that come from? Uh, there's some fascinating stuff there. Wow, that is amazing. I always have dreams about floods. Giant floods? floods happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's a that's very unique to California. Myth. Yeah, but it's funny that you just mentioned snakes because I was I was thinking about it's it's a little bit irrational in our modern age that we have this fear of snakes. Yeah, but if you believe in this collective memory, if you go back to our primate days, snakes are one of the biggest predators of primates, and it would make sense that we would be kind of we would have this inherent fear of snakes and that maybe carried on for thousands of generations all the way to now it it makes sense to me mark it makes yeah <laughs> it makes yeah. it makes sense to me and if, if, you, if you spend any time with children like like i have it's it's insane to watch them in nature because all they do is climb all they want to do is is climb on jungle gyms or trees and i think it's it's probably calling back to something in, in our simian nature uh you know before we left uh for the for the savannas there's there's something really um primal about humans and i think that part of this religion with no name is that if you think about it like before, again before writing so writing is five thousand years old if, if if you really extend the timeline out our species is at least four hundred thousand years old it could be older and there are predecessor hominids that go back obviously much further homo erectus is at least a couple million uh, but erectus had fire and so if Erectus had fire and was sitting around the campfire telling stories and originating some of this mythology, largely by looking up at the sky, probably, and telling stories about the stars, how many generations are we talking about there where some kind of religious sensibility is, is developing? Uh, again, for 99%, over 99% of what we, what we call human evolution, like that to me is a fascinating idea something i want to i definitely want to write about that is well because we only really have recorded history for five thousand years but we've been around modern anatomically humans for four hundred thousand years that's you know like you said 99 percent about of just we know nothing it's like there's a veil and behind it we just know nothing and that that's why that's why Graham's work is uh, inspires a lot of people because we don't have much to lean on. <laughs> we have these ancient stone structures and we have stories that get passed down about floods, by the way. Uh, uh, and I know you're a fan of, of uh, Randall Carlson as well. Um, and so it's it wouldn't shock me in the slightest to think that there are these there were these cataclysmic moments 
in our history that were obviously traumatic. And I mean, for us and other species, and, and, and the memory of that story was, was somehow retained in these, in these flood myths that abound, again, on cultures that we're not supposed to have interaction with one another on different continents. You can find the flood myth uh, virtually everywhere across the world. So it's probably speaking to something. Absolutely. Some, some of the trips I've gone on with Randall, I've been on four now. Uh, probably the most profound is the Scablands in Washington, Eastern Washington. Wow where you just have this landscape that's been just swept through and you can get drone shots of it and it it looks like ripples on the beach, but they're thousands, millions of times the size of those ripples. You know, one ripple will be like 50 feet high. And some of the evidence is really astonishing because you'll have a boulder the size of a three-story house and it's just in the middle of a farmland, some barren farmland. And we look at these boulders and we're like, okay, where did this come from? And it was ripped from a mountain 100 miles away. And how did it get there? Well, according to Randall, it, it, it gets scraped up by a giant iceberg the size of an oil tanker. And it gets moved and then it, get, it gets settled down and then the ice melts. And that's how you get these rocks in these random fields. And we go up to the farmer and the farmer's like, I, I just thought this was something in the way of my tractor. It's been annoying me for 50 years. <laughs> But we're like, no, this is evidence of a giant flood. And once you once you get eyes to see the all the scars on the earth, it really changes your perspective. And you realize that change doesn't really happen one grain of sand or one drop of water at a time. It can happen in an instant. You know, that giant flood that happened in eastern Washington started and commenced in about a week. So all that change in the landscape happened in a week. Wow. So I, it makes sense that there's this like collective memory that harkens back to this giant flood and it, you see it in all the myths around the world. Wow. And this is why you have nightmares about floods, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I brought it on myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <clears throat> so um, I guess I, I wanted to talk to you about religion a little bit. It seems like our culture is moving away from um, religion. I just heard a, a crazy statistic that in America, there's more people that are non-religious than are religious now. There are mm. more people not going to church, not affiliated with the church, than people who are. Where, yeah. as America used to be, almost all Christian. Yeah. Um, and it reminds me of what uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said: "God is dead." And I would love to hear what your thoughts on what that means. Yeah, well, I love I love Nietzsche for lots of reasons, um, and he was he was a classicist, by the way, or at least familiar enough with uh, the ancient tales and mythology, uh, and he writes about Dionysus quite a bit. And what I think, what he meant by by God is dead, he actually said, "So all the gods are dead, all the gods are dead," and he looked forward to the Ubermensch uh, emanating the, this concept of, of of the perfect human. In an age when even then, this is over 100 years ago, obviously. So even then, when religion was sort of in a decline, or, or maybe it was Judeo-Christian morality was in decline, or maybe it was the end of philosophy or metaphysics, there's a lot of debate over what he what he meant by that. But it seems to be bearing out in, in, in what you mentioned. Like, I think it was two years ago, there was a Gallup poll that said exactly what, what you just mentioned, that I think it's like 47% of Americans um, are affiliated with some sort of um, religious uh, membership. Uh, and that is obviously a minority. And that's a first in the, in like, I think the eight decades they've been conducting that kind of survey. So even a generation ago, like in the late nineties, I think it was like 70%, seven zero were affiliated with some kind of church or temple. Uh, and I think it was at some point like, in the seven, 74 percent, 75 percent in the 1940s was was the height. So like three in four Americans were going to church or temple uh, a few generations ago. And now it's it's the minority and and dropping. Right. So that that that's Americans at large, like amongst like millennials or those younger. I think it's like the spiritual, but not religious or the unaffiliated. A few years ago, it was already like a third. 
And so I'd be shocked if it wasn't like in the 40 percentile somewhere and, and growing. And so like, what does that mean? <laughs> it's something we have to come to terms with. There's, there's clearly like a, a, a great unchurching in not just, not just in this country, which is a fairly religious country, by the way, but, you know, go, go, go to Europe and it's, it's even, it's even more drastic um, where Christianity was really, you know, held, held tight for uh, thousand and a half years. Um, so I think that we're living at a time where people are looking for, for meaning outside church. I don't, I don't think that, that the God of antiquity is dead. And we, we did a fun project with Karen Armstrong uh, which people can look called called the God paradox, where we're looking at different definitions of God over time, right? And I don't think the God of antiquity is necessarily dead, but this this notion of a personal God, I think, is something that that doesn't resonate with with young people, right? And this notion of uh, stories and origin myths that don't necessarily make sense uh, to a lot of young people. Um, doctrine and dogma with which they don't agree, uh, moralism that seems outdated. And I think people, by and large, are looking for some kind of experience of that ancient God, which Karen Armstrong was quick to point out, one of the world's you know, foremost writers on religion, uh, that the, the ancient concept of God was this notion of a force, like it was more, more like an impersonal God, something that was um, something that was integral to the nature of the universe itself, something like a, a force that is uh, immutable and unchangeable uh and the the interesting part is that 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 force somehow has expression in us and that you can find this concept of the divine not only in all of nature but in us as well this notion of the divine spark you see this in all the the esoteric traditions of all the world's great faiths whether it's the abrahamic faith or in hinduism buddhism confucianism taoism they all talk about this force and this sense of the divine that flows within us, so that it's all it's it's within us, it's without us, it flows through us, that somehow we participate in this grand experiment. So I think now that that sounds kind of like new agey, <laughs> and that sounds kind of kind of pagan, um, but that that really was the working definition of God in all these great traditions from the axial age that we talk about in that in that video. And I think it's funny that that's that's the kind of of God, and that's a very tricky word, just like religion. I think that that's the kind of sensibility that is speaking to people. It's not that God is dead, but uh, the notion of a God stuck up in the clouds is dead, or the notion of a God that that commands us to do certain things versus others, or that there are these preconditions to entering heaven. This notion that heaven is even something that like uh, that falls after this lifetime, or hell for that matter. Um, when you look in the mystical tradition, traditions, you find more, more subtle ways of thinking about God, religion, death. And again, this is why people invested in the mysteries of, of antiquity. And I do sense some of that coming back, like through psychedelic practice and yoga, meditation, mindfulness, through all these practices. I, I sense people trying to get in touch with something that always rang true to our species with amnesia. And that could very well be tens of thousands of years old. This idea that um, you need to see God and experience God in order to to know your truest self. Uh, and I think that's that's the God that's not quite dead and is trying to 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 rear her head again. Mm. So it seems like there's there's some very uh, positive benefits to kind of getting rid of that old traditional God in the clouds. You can kind of go and have your own personal relationship with God. Is there any negatives to getting rid of these common belief systems? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, if we just get rid of all religion, you know, if we go to zero percent, right now we're at forty-seven percent. Right. What? What do you, is all hell going to break loose? <laughs> <laughs> well, it might. Uh, I, th I think. I think what the, what the the I think one of the great values of these traditions is just is just is the wisdom, the accumulated wisdom, and so like the God that we're talking about, the, it was written about by Saint Augustine and Thomas Aquinas in the Christian tradition. This notion, and it's mentioned in in the video, this notion of like there's a way to think about God that is probably different than the way you think about it, and 
it, it was the way that a lot of the, the greatest minds thought about this very tricky topic, right? Not, not as something external to you, but something to be investigated. And when you look into the esoteric traditions and the mystical traditions and the contemplative traditions of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them, I think you find, um, you find a lot of wisdom, right? Uh, for, for how to access that, that notion of the divine. And also there's also the, the, the sense of community. And so like we're, we're developing community in different ways. Uh, but I do think that the 21st century um, is a real litmus test for these institutions. Because I, I wonder how the younger generations are going to react to this and the kind of communities they want to build around this experience. Like, I do think that psychedelics, for example, uh, are probably one of the more, more powerful initiation experiences somebody can have if, if you prepare for it properly, like they did in antiquity, right? Which means taking years to invest in that process. And the notion of that, that peak experience being the seed for a spiritual life that you then continue investigating and, and, and building some sort of spirituality behind it, a community to support it. Uh, I think like on, on its own, it probably won't have the impact that it did in, in antiquity. And the impact I'm talking about is that the mysteries of Eleusis were said to hold the whole human species together. Like that's, that, that's a big idea. Uh, and so how do you build that kind of ritual around technology that powerful? I think that's what these old traditions can, uh, can bring to bear on this notion of the, these, these techniques. Uh, so whether that, that's to be found you know, between the churches and temples and mosques, or it's in conversation with like <laughs> the classicists and historians who are trying to resurrect some of this practice from antiquity, there's there's a lot of a lot of value there i think that uh we we do well to to revisit yeah it seems like in the past we greatly looked to religion to answer existential questions and now we have technology and science what we think we do to answer a lot of these questions but ultimately technology and science they still get to the end of the road and they're like we don't know you know and uh there's this concept that I, I heard of recently called Chesterton's fence. Have you heard of that? No. It's, it's if you're walking in the, in the middle of nowhere and you come across a fence, before you destroy it, figure out why the fence is there. <laughs> and I think it's a good metaphor for religion. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years before history even began. And so we have this kind of reaction now in our modern culture, like, oh, we don't need it get rid of it. There's a lot of atheists, you know, like Sam Harris or something. Right. Just, we don't need it. And I, I'm kind of come to the conclusion that like, we may not need it for certain reasons, but let's, let's be careful before we destroy this fence. Because we may not know the full extent. Take a look at the fence. I, I would yeah. take a look at the fence and I, you know what I would do? I would go to the bottom of that fence and I would try and figure out who built that and why? Because they must have built it for a reason. And I would investigate the roots of that fence to see how deep it goes, because it, it probably served a purpose for some time. And it may, it may not serve a purpose any longer, uh, but people spent time and energy erecting that fence for a reason. And there's a lot you can chip off and maybe some of it's useless, um, but I would look down into the roots. There, there's this phrase, that pops up in Latin in my book. It's called ad fontes, which was the the crying call of the of the Renaissance. The, the, this notion of looking to the source, going back to the source, ad fontes. And like as a classicist and historian, um, and as a lover of all these traditions, the more you look to the source, the more commonality you find. And there's there's something really valuable there. So maybe that one fence in the wild, you look around and you find all kinds of fences that had some kind of, <laughs> had some kind of value over time um, and have become one with their environment in a way. And I think that religion at its best or some of these contemplative traditions at their best, I'm talking about the mysteries, for example, I don't think, I don't think they should be relegated to the past. Like there, there's a way to investigate those traditions seriously and figure out why they brought meaning to like the best and brightest people for the longest time, right? For, for 2000 years, why did Plato or Marcus Aurelius on either side of this tradition 
decide to uh, invest all that time and energy in this experience? Why did Marcus Aurelius rebuild this temple site that no one's heard of uh, 1800 years ago when it was destroyed by barbarians? What, what, did, what did people find at this site? And I mention all this because sometimes the further you investigate one of these fences, you might just be surprised. So I'll share something with you. Um, at, at Eleusis, the, this ancient site that we're talking about, which again, like even as a classicist, you don't investigate that much. Uh, a couple of years ago, this it's still around. It's called Elefsina today. It's a small town of about 30,000 people. And it was nominated to be the European capital of culture by the European Union. So of all the cities in Europe, and they, they, they choose two or three a year, Eleusis, of all the cities, was spotlighted as the capital of culture. And because of the pandemic, it was postponed until this year. So 2023 is the year of Elefsina, Eleusis, across Europe, this tiny town that probably no one's ever heard of. This September, at around the same time when the ancient pilgrims themselves would have showed up to this, this, this temple complex to drink that potion and have this immortalizing vision with, with the goddesses, uh, the, the EU and, and some friends in Greece are hosting uh, a three-day three symposium to talk about the ancient mysteries and what they meant uh, to antiquity and also to today, how they could restore our compact with mother nature, which, is, which was the whole point of the ancient mysteries, to blur this boundary between humanity and nature and the gods and goddesses, and to ask some like some like very profound questions about what does some of this ancient wisdom hold for us today? So the more you investigate those fences, you might just be surprised. <clears throat> wow, that's a great story. And I think that pil pilgrimages are going to see a revival. I just had a podcast with uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, yeah. And he's gotten Rupert. really into uh, pilgrimages. And he was yeah. telling me about how important it is to, to go on a long walk, to actually walk to the site, how that creates an entirely different experience. And I visited him in uh, London. And while I was out there, I visited a whole bunch of cathedrals. And when you go in those cathedrals, you really do, you look up and you're, you're like, all right, there's something here. This is, this is like a gateway to heaven here. And you get in there and you just you can't even speak. You're just silent for hours and you just look at all the art and it took so many generations and so much thought went into every single detail of that cathedral. And I guess it, it, it calls back to, especially here on the West coast in California, if a building's over five years old, we just tear it down. <laughs> so we don't have history like that. So when you see something that has lasted that long, you're like, mm. it's like Chesterton's fence. You're like, mm okay, this has been here for thousands of years. Maybe there's something to it. And Rupert has an interesting idea about the, those pilgrimage trails. And he's reached out to a number of, of, of those cathedrals. Um, and there's this sense of like repurposing them for, uh, for contemplation and meditation, uh, which, yeah, what do we do with these buildings that are being, <laughs> are being unchurched? Like if the minority of people are visiting in this country, and it's the same in Europe. Like, what 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 becomes of all these old old places? There's, I think there's the, there's the potential for some revitalization there. I mean, they were they were built for a reason, um, and they invite introspection. And so you can go do it in nature too. You can go find a nice a nice forest somewhere. I think I think that'll do it. Uh, but you have all these 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 beautiful buildings that so much time and effort went into. And Rupert has a, a an amazing idea about how to repurpose them. I think we will see a revival of maybe not the old form of religion, but something new, like maybe the church will adapt into something new and incorporate mysteries and psychedelics into it. Um, sorry, so there was a big crash outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I think there would be a re revival of religion because a lot of the things that we're moving towards right now are not going to last long. I, I think they're like the social media life, this nihilism, the incel life, the only fans, the certain archetypes that I'm seeing emerge. They just don't seem like they're going to lead to like community and long lasting 
values and morals. Yeah. So I'm I'm just kind of witnessing it all from a distance. I'm observing, and I so when I do see these something that's been around for thousands of years, I'm like, okay, what? Why is this here for so long? Well, what what about this is keeping it lasting? That's interesting, and it's yeah. I mean it'll have to adapt, right? Uh, and this was. This is part of the the thesis behind the religion with no name is that it, it adapts to the time. I mean, all religions adapt to the time. Uh, and all all these contemplative traditions, all all this practice, they they always adapt. And I think we're we're seeing that now too, like in in the rise of yoga and mindfulness. I mean, <laughs> like yoga, the way it's practiced today, is very different from the way the way it was done in in South Asia uh, centuries ago. So it's it's being adapted, not necessarily for the best, but uh, I think I think it's an interesting moment, like this 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 man versus machine, uh, and I think that we've already seen the ills of so like we know we know that social media isn't good. <laughs> we know we know where this where this leads, and some people are probably watching this on social media. But like we <laughs> so there's there 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 are positives to this technology, but I think to the extent that it, it draws us away from each other, um, and and keeps like this this human body clutching a phone all day is probably not the highest expression of what we were what we we're designed for true but yeah like you said it, it can also be used for good it's an incredibly powerful tool and we can kind of get dragged down into it or we can use it like the things that we've created millions of people have seen which is pretty awesome you know <laughs> I often forget that. <laughs> like like our, our first video was titled um, The Best Kept Secret in History. And I kind of thought, I was like, all right, that's a pretty clickbaity title. But not one comment. I read thousands of comments. Not one comment said this is a clickbaity title. Huh. Which means that that must actually be the best kept secret in history. Because <laughs> people are very quick to call you out on YouTube. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't pull yeah. punches. Like they're like, all right, what is this clickbaity title? And they're like, okay, well, actually, that that was pretty. That was the best kept secret in history, huh? So, well, good, good, good for Houston Smith who came up with that. That's uh, <laughs> that's I think <laughs> it's it's reassuring. It's reassuring. It's <laughs> it's a testament to what you do, man. Oh well, I really appreciate you, and hopefully, we'll create more. I'm I'm looking I'm looking forward to it, man. I hope I hope you don't put down the whiteboard anytime soon. Never. Never. It's right behind me. <laughs> All right. Here's a here's an interesting question that I had for you. Okay. So we're talking a lot about AI right now. Yeah. It seems to be the craze. Are we creating a god with AI? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I I wouldn't be the first to say that either. By the way, I think Elon Musk like a decade ago said that it was summoning the demon. We're summoning this 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 other intelligence, um, and that probably came. I was, I was reading this book actually because in twenty in twenty fourteen a lot there was a lot of controversy being stirred. I think from uh, Nick Bostrom's book Super Intelligence. I've been reading reading through this, uh, and this is this is a decade ago, by the way. So you can imagine uh, in the fracas of Chat GPT, what's happened since. But uh, I've I, I've been following a lot of this actually, and the Future of Life Institute, and all these 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 dire warnings against this this coming apocalyptic moment there's there, there's something really profound in this in this intelligence i do think it's yeah it, it's alien to the extent that i think it's it's forcing us to ask questions about what it means to be human and interestingly whether in the renaissance or going back to antiquity that's sort of the the working definition of, of why we have these disciplines or why the mysteries may have existed, or why religions are born. Like, what what kind of creatures are we? What are we born for? Uh, a couple of years ago, this is going to seem like a tangent, but the classics department at Howard University here in, in D.C. Uh, was announced that it would be shutting down its classics department. And Cornell West, of all people, came out in defense of the classics and calling down, calling out uh, the, this, this potential dismissal of the classics, uh, a spiritual catastrophe for people. And how the classics uh, have always guided the way we think about uh, some all the questions we're asking we're asking here, by the way, uh, and about how like even even the choice to ignore the past and to ignore these questions is still a choice unrooted in any in any foundations, and and his point there is that 
uh, you know, there, there's a way to ask these, these questions uh, that really get down to what it means to be, to be us and th these great mysteries of life. And I think AI is just another way of asking about us and less about this alien intelligence. I think it's the same with psychedelics. When people have these transpersonal experiences where they're transcending time and space and they're seeing themselves from, from a different vantage and they're confronting death, most, most importantly, their mortality. I think you see this with like the UAP phenomenon. Earlier this morning, Sean Kirkpatrick is there with a bunch of, uh, bunch of analysts. Uh, UAP? Talking. Yeah, uh, un, un, yeah uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. Oh, okay. I used to call them UFOs. You, yeah, people, <laughs> okay. I, th I think you can still call them UFOs. Okay, I'm that but, old. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Whether, whether it's UFOs or artificial intelligence uh, or psychedelics, again and again, I think we're being asked the question that, that Cornell, Cornell West was trying to drive at, like, what kind of creatures are we? And so when we when we're examining ourselves through the lens of, of of AI and this this potential super intelligence that Nick Bostrom is writing about, we're clearly at a moment here. We're 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 at a crossroads. My my personal opinion is that it doesn't result in the complete annihilation of the species, but there are some very profound questions uh, about like what this alien intelligence has in mind for us. I think one of the one of the best conspiracy theories I've heard to date is that AI is a traveler from the future that's gone back in time to manipulate us into creating it, which I think is fantastic sci-fi. So like, uh, and th this is this is the realm of sci-fi, right? I mean, how many movies can you list out that mention the the coming robot apocalypse, right? From uh, HAL, HAL 9000 and to Terminator to Ultron. So I don't think we can avoid this question. And I think there'll be like obvious impacts on the labor market um uh like deep fake is probably the most like pressing uh question of the time like where where do you go for information how do we tell right from wrong uh and what does this ultimately say about us that we're unleashing this intelligence that is there to to mimic humans <laughs> in 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 all their in all their glory and all their gory details so what does it mean to to mimic that part of us that is that is untruthful right that is that is deceitful um these these are big questions yeah i think almost like chesterton's fence or religion there's there's going to be good and bad with everything so i think there's a lot of fear and terror around this force that's coming and we know it's coming and we can't stop it it's like we we don't we can't even push the off button on this thing it's like got a light, mind of its own it's going forward and it's just gonna is as much as elon musk and all these people will give us warnings it's still coming and so there's yeah. a lot of terror, existential terror and dread about that. But also it could help us reach our, our greatest potential. You know, we are limited by what we can create. We can, we're limited by time and our bi biology. Yeah. AI could maybe, we could travel throughout the entire galaxy in a second with AI. Yeah. Or if you can imagine something, you can make it real in a second with AI. So uh, I've heard that we're coming towards the new economy is going to be called the narrator economy. Have you heard that? No. Where we had the, we're coming out of the creator economy, the influencer economy, that was short. And now we're coming into this narrator economy where we're going to get to the point where if you can narrate something, if you can create a story, you can make it happen. Like if I can think of Lord of the Rings, I don't need a film crew or to hire actors or anything i can use ai to make that movie happen hmm. that's gonna put a big dent in hollywood <laughs> i think it already is yeah yeah all the writers are on strike because they're using ai to write the scripts yeah yeah it's it's uh it's unavoidable D does it is is after school also implicated can ai do what you do no <laughs> no. um, gosh I, I don't know i mean for now i think i'm okay but alex gray who i've worked with he's one of my favorite painters he is my favorite painter yeah and there's images all over the internet of alex gray themed ai art and it it does look amazing yeah but i'm kind of like this thing isn't really creating. It seems like it's just synthesizing things that were already created in the past. So I, I, I don't, 
but isn't that kind of what creation is? You're just taking a bunch of data points. You're taking all these experiences that are data points and you're synthesizing it into a creation. Mm -hmm. So like if you spent your whole life in Egypt, your art would be very Egyptian in style. It's kind of like that. Those are your data points. <clears throat> so the AI has a lot of data points to work off of. How do we know that that you're not AI, for example? I mean, you you take the you take these beautiful audio narrations and you you combine it in in classic AI fashion with some beautiful animation to produce something that is altogether different than its component parts and very and very creative. But I I wonder how do we know you're not AI? Oh man, <laughs> well I definitely don't think AI can do what you're doing. <laughs> Maybe it could. I'm sure AI would like to do an Illusinian mystery. That I'd, that I'd like to see, actually. That would be if, really interesting. If 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 it could recreate, if it could help us recreate what was actually happening there, or any historian for that matter, at any point in history, if it can help us recreate that, there there's something, yeah, there's something to dive into. Huh. Okay. Well, we got a couple of other final questions. Okay. What do you think the meaning of life is? <laughs> Simple one. <laughs> a little one. Um, wow. Uh, I've, I've been asked this before, and I typically plagiarize Joseph Campbell. So I will, I will happily plagiarize Joseph Campbell in homage, and I'll try and say something original. Uh, so uh, Joseph Campbell said, this is in one of our videos, actually. That, that's why I'm saying it. I think this is this is in the best kept secret. Uh, Joseph Campbell says, I think that what we're looking for um, is not the meaning of life, but an experience. So he turns the question back back on itself. And he says that uh, what we're all looking for is uh, is an experience of being alive so that the experiences that we do have on the purely physical realm will have resonances within that are those of our innermost being and reality so that we feel the rapture of being alive i think we have the, that whole clip in one of the videos which i've memorized for years now so whenever i'm asked that question that's the first thing i say um which which ties back into this this notion of of why the religion with no name is something that could have been perpetuated for for so long over so many generations because it was about an experience of being alive not not believing in something or thinking that life has a meaning Joseph Campbell said that life has no meaning. Life has no intrinsic meaning. Um, but what, what it does have are these, these, these moments of experience where you do truly feel alive. And I think we also say in, in our first video that, uh, you know, I don't think you know what it means to be alive or if there's a meaning of life unless you've died. So this is, this is, the, this is the original part of how I'll answer the question. I think that um, to die... In, in a very meaningful way uh, is to understand the meaning of life. And so, although in my book, you know, we talk about these ancient rites and mysteries, we talk about psychedelics, we talk about Jesus, we talk about prehistoric grain, and, and we talk about lots of different things. What it, what it comes down to is, is the phrase that begins the book and that begins our first video, which is, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And that, that to me, that's, I think that's the key. It might, it might not, it might not be the meaning of life, but I think that is the key to beginning to have one of those experiences in which you feel the rapture of being alive. And so it looks different for different people. In my own case, I had a near death experience when I was a young boy, uh, which stayed with me for years and came back onto my radar when I began reading about other near death experiences and psychedelics and these archaic techniques which, which to me, and I'm, I'm doing a talk about this in New York City uh, next week, by the way, at the New York Academy of Sciences. I think what, what, what they bring me to is the, this sense of a, a near-death state of awareness. I think that was the point of the ancient mysteries. I think it's also the point of these contemplative traditions. I think it's the point of uh, a really good music or art when you're in the flow of that experience uh, where, where, where life becomes timeless. I think I think in, in any way that you can experience the timelessness, that timeless quality of life, the eternity that is present in the here and now, I think that's when you begin to grasp that life has some kind of meaning that it's drawing you towards. Um, and that's not necessarily what we think of it. 
that basically uh, all at once, all at one moment, we are both living and dying, which is one of the great paradoxes we explored in our second video. So there's there's no easy way to answer this, but I feel like the closer you get to actual death, physical death, or maybe a profound psychological death, right? And some of these psychedelic experiences, ego dissolution, the closer you get to one of those experiences, I think the closer you're getting to the, the value and meaning of life, which is this experience of truly being present in the moment, which is not a single point in time, but an expansive, timeless sense of eternity. So it's not that after your physical death, there's more life to come. It's that right here, right now, is that heaven that religions speak of, is that kingdom, is that sense of, of eternity. As I'm looking at you right here, right now, there truly is this sense of, um, of awe, I think, that arises in those moments. And it's, and it's a paradox because when it's truly experienced in its purest form, I think you're neither alive nor dead. You're neither dreaming nor awake. You're in touch with the sense of consciousness that imbues the whole cosmos. That was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you said paradox, it, it's so true. All the great questions are paradoxes. The answers to the great questions are paradoxes. Like in order to live, you have to die. You know, when you search for your, who you are, you find God. The, the closer you come to finding yourself, the closer you come to finding God. Hmm. The closer you come to finding God, the closer you come to finding yourself. Hmm. It's like, all these paradox show, show up in these deep questions, you know, like God created man, but maybe man created God. Paradox. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody created you, by the way. And, and there, there, there's, no, there, there's no crazier experience in life than watching a human being come out of another human being, uh, which I got to experience twice. It's, wow. it's, it, it's, it's, it's insane to witness that, that event where my wife, a single individual, becomes two people for a time, and there's there's another being growing inside her, and that being comes outside of her. And even though that being is now physically separate from her, there's there's no real emotional separation, psychological separation. The infant doesn't even know it's a separate being for for months thereafter. Mm. Uh, and so that that life's you know we are born into one of life's greatest paradoxes. You know, where what were we before? we were in the womb and what are we after um and what are we now we all we all come from somewhere and go somewhere uh, but maybe it's all happening at once yeah maybe that's where that collective memory comes from because you really there is no exact start point of life like you can't when you really get down to it you can't separate one life like your daughter's life started in you and that started in your parents and that started in your and it goes all the way you can't you can't unbreak that chain it's it's like an unbroken chain that goes all the way back to the beginning of life the chain with no name the chain with no name yeah <laughs> so uh okay last question so what are you working on in the future uh okay cool so there's there's a second book somewhere um which is continuing to explore a lot of these a lot of these mysteries uh i was um i'm always dissatisfied with that with that quest which remains like very very personal to me uh so i don't i don't share too much about it publicly but there's there are, are more questions that were were unanswered so writing uh writing a second book uh is definitely on the on the horizon and uh, which which means going back and forth to to Europe as as much as I can, uh, doing talks, uh, which is which is fun. Uh, I've done a couple recently, and we'll do some more over the summer. And uh, the paperback of the Immortality Key finally comes out in October, so there's that to look forward to. It's been three years, which is a pretty long timeline. So come come October, uh, I'll be back doing some some media appearances and. And talking more about the book and what's happened since there's a new afterword that i wrote for for the book sort of charting all the new discoveries that have uh uh come up over the past uh two two and a half years and there's some pretty incredible things uh some more data showing that our ancestors had this profound relationship with psychedelics uh which is now being uh, well studied within the academy uh, and and capturing headlines on the regular so uh, lots of 
interesting developments happening around this field, which I vowed that I would stick with for, I think I said a decade, a couple of years ago. So I'll, I'll stick with this for the rest of the 2020s. Thank God. <laughs> um, well, I, I loved your podcast with Joe Rogan. That's where I first discovered you. And I think that podcast really impacted Joe too, because he literally talks about it every episode. I, I hear him. I listen to like one out of maybe 10 episodes he does now, but I feel like he mentions you every single episode. And you only did one <laughs> podcast with him, right? <laughs> to my knowledge, yeah. yeah. No, I, I I owe Joe a huge, a huge debt of gratitude and and, and a huge thanks. He was uh that was that was my very first interview ever about about the book. Wow. And it's also during the pandemic, which which I kind of forgot. That that was September 2020. So I went, uh, I flew to Austin to do that interview and then left the country. I went to Uruguay with uh, my wife and, and the girls like for the next year. So that was like my first and only in-person interview until the next year. Were you, were you um, like nervous going on the show? Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think it would happen. There was a part of me didn't think it would happen because we had, to, we were getting like rapid, uh, rapid COVID tests and you know, I had no idea if I'd been exposed or not. So th there was a small chance that uh, I had to test in, in the studio before we went on. So there was always a chance that it was positive and, and the whole thing never happened. There, that was always a small chance. And then trying to remember everything I'd written and had been like holding in my heart for 12 years and trying to get it out in an intelligible way was, yeah, it's, 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 it's nerve wracking, man. That was um, a huge one. And I, Graham Hancock joined that remotely, right? Yeah, he was on, the, he was on yeah. a little... Computer Which, monitor. Yeah. I don't think Joe ever does that, right? He he never has people join in remotely. I don't think that that could have been. I think it was a first. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, Graham should have been there in person, uh, but it was it was it was impossible with uh, with COVID. It was impossible. Yeah, um, that was an amazing podcast because I I kind of get when he, whenever he has a comedian on, I just don't really want to hear about comedy clubs, but then. <laughs> He probably had like 10 comedians in a row. And I was like, not that one. Now, and then I was like, oh, the mysteries. And then clicked on it. And everybody was saying, you got to listen to this one. This one's amazing. And you just burst onto the scene. And then I reached out to you shortly after and we made our video. That's right. It, it wasn't that long after. Yeah. Yeah. I, I caught you at the right time. Now you're the, like the, <laughs> superstar. The, <laughs> the perfect time. I, I owe you and Joe a huge, a huge debt of thanks. I mean that you, you too, Mark. I owe you a big, a big thanks for for getting me to to think uh, get through some ideas that that deserved a different format. Like I'd never thought about animating that the some of those ideas. So oh. uh, I love working with you. I think there's there's some more ideas brewing, uh, and there's lots of work ahead. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure working with you too, and. I look forward to many more. I'm very grateful for your contribution. Don't put down the whiteboard, man. Never. Don't put down the pen and paper. <laughs> That's a, it's a deal. All right. I'm going to end this transmission. Thank you for joining the Before School podcast, everybody. This is Brian Morescu. Check out the Immortality Key. And it's going to be available in paperback in October. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'm going to end the recording and then we can...